Thank you so much, Rita. That was excellent and so informative for everyone in our audience. I'm now going to hand things over to Sharon Denny and Ben Freeman, and I'll ask David Pfeiffer and Helen Ann Comstock to join me in these seats on the stage for our final session. Masks off. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. So we're back. Now Ben and I have the honor of introducing today's closing session. AFTD was founded in 2002, and later this year will mark 20 years in operation. So that's 20 years of volunteers and health professionals working to help families affected by FTD. It's 20 years of families and researchers working together to advance FTD research and build a community. It's 20 years of donors and advocates driving the mission that we share. 20 years of grief and loss. 20 years of names we hold dear with us today, as Rita said. And 20 years of resilience, determination, and hope to put an end to the disease we call FTD. To close out this year's conference, we have a special presentation to share with you. It's a discussion between Susan Dickinson, AFTD CEO, um, since 2008 and our founder, Helen Ann Comstock, as well as our board chair, Mr. David Pfeiffer. Together, we'll share where we, they'll share where we've been, where we stand as a community today. And what we hope to tackle together by moving from hope to action. And now, without further delay, we'll hand things back to Susan. Thank you, Thank you, Sar Thank you Sharon and Ben. We appreciate it. And it's great to have um, Helen Ann Comstock, our founder, here with us, as well as David Pfeiffer, as Sharon said, our current board chair. Um, as Rita mentioned, Helen Ann, it's been 20 years since you founded AFTD. Um, and I think maybe we should start, you and I have spoken several times about your own journey with this disease, um, with your husband, Craig. And I was wondering if you'd share a little bit of that story with our audience today. Well, it's certainly hard to follow someone like Rita. <laughs> but um, my husband was a math professor and researcher at the Naval Postgraduate School on the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, he was the father of three children, two teen, uh, three teenagers, uh, one in college, two in high school. We had a very nice life on the Monterey Peninsula. We're active in the community, um, had great times with our children who were doing well in school, and all seemed to be well. But I did notice that Craig seemed to be quieter. He didn't have very much to say. And I thought, as a test for this, we were driving to San Francisco over 100 miles, and I thought, I am not going to say anything until Craig says something. Well, we got to the Golden Gate Bridge, and I couldn't stand it any longer, so <laughs> I started to talk. So I uh, talked with Craig and said, you know, I'm just concerned that we should look into this. Uh, he didn't see that there was anything wrong, but he agreed to go to the doctor. And I set up an appointment with a neurologist on the Monterey Peninsula. <clears throat> First he thought, Craig has um, a brain tumor. And then he did some more tests, and his nurse called me and said, oh, Mrs. Comstock, you're going to be so relieved. It isn't a brain tumor. It's just Alzheimer's. Well, first of all, this was in 1978, before the National Alzheimer's Association had even been founded. Alzheimer's was not a word in my vocabulary, and I knew very few people who'd ever heard of it. I couldn't find anything at the main library on the Monterey Peninsula but some medical friends provided me with information on Alzheimer's. 
when I realized that this was not perhaps better than a brain tumor. So I thought we should have a second diagnosis. And we went to a Maine University hospital on the West Coast, had all of the tests, and at the end, the head of neurology came out and said to me, well, Mrs. Comstock, um, your husband has Alzheimer's. There's nothing I can give you to read. There is no treatment, no cure. So just take your husband home and accept a change in lifestyle. Wow, that has to have been the biggest understatement I've ever heard. Um, at any rate, that started us on our journey to um, find a way to deal with something like Alzheimer's. On the other hand, fortunately for me, there was a member of the diagnostic team who wanted me to stop at his office before leaving. And he said, I think your husband has Pick's disease. Now today we would call Pick's disease frontotemporal degeneration. So, um, and he knew that my husband had a sabbatical because of course he was still teaching um, and we were going to Switzerland. And he said, there is a specialist in Switzerland who treats um, Pick's disease. So he set up appointments for us. When we got to Switzerland, we spent five mornings at his clinic. And when he was finished, he said, I really do believe your husband has Pick's disease. And he gave me what I found to be the best advice. He said, your behavior will have a big impact on Craig's behavior. And you need to learn to slow down and be calmer, which I tried to follow. <laughs> um, but anyway, it, it was somewhat a relief to find out that there was something else possibly that made more sense than Alzheimer's, but also very daunting to figure what lay ahead for us. Thank so. you, Melania. Um, I wonder if you can jump ahead um, several years and share how and why you turned that experience into founding an organization focused specifically on this form of dementia. Well, that took a number of years. Um, after my husband died, when he was 50, we returned to the East Coast where my family was and also my husband's. And I had heard about the Alzheimer's Association. And since there was nothing for Pick's disease, I started to go to uh, a monthly meeting that was held at Penn. And through that, uh, I learned that they were going to form a, a chapter and I became involved with it and became the first executive director of the uh, Alzheimer's Association of Greater Philadelphia, which is now a much bigger group. At any rate, in that capacity, I started a support group for Pick's disease. And that support group had a lot of really interested uh, family members to the point where they suggested we have a, a conference about Pick's disease because one had not been done in the US. And so we had uh, gathered money from members of the group as well as a few grants and had the first uh, conference on Pick's disease in 1989 in Philadelphia. That allowed me to meet so many people because since it was the first and only PICS conference, it was full of researchers from across the country as well as family members. So that later when um, I went to NIH to say, well, okay, what needs to be done to put more money into research for PICS disease? Uh, I was told pretty emphatically by several researchers, 
until there's a national organization, nothing much is going to happen. So why don't you start one? Well, <laughs> I did learn a lot from my work with the Alzheimer's Association, and especially from that PICS disease support group. Uh, and with the encouragement of researchers like John Trojanowski and Murray Grossman and Virginia Lee, Marcel Mejulum from Chicago, and uh, uh, yes, from Bruce Miller. Bruce Miller, thank you, from California. I already knew a lot of researchers who all immediately said, yes, we would like to be on your medical advisory council. And then I had met several caregivers from across the country, and everyone was very willing to be part of our new board. And so that's how it started. And we also benefited from the fact that it was possible to do some things by computer, and, and there were conference calls. We still didn't have Zoom, uh, but uh, it enabled us to have a national board and be able to get together. So that's how it happened. I, I think, Helena, one of the things that has always really impressed me was your vision in pulling together not just the caregiver perspective on this disease, but also pulling those professionals in. Mm -hmm. Because I think it gave this organization a really strong foundation to be recognized, um, having, having such a broad mission across both camps. Do you agree, David? I do agree, yes. And I, I would say, I would echo what Susan just said. I, thank you, Helen Ann, for having uh, founded an organization that um, is broadly focused, and we, we uh, do work in community support and education and research, and it's a lot, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing going forward, but I thank you for that. Um, I, um, I, speaking of things that we're doing, and speaking of, uh, well, just first of all, it's so incredibly wonderful for us all to be in the same room, and uh, given, the, given the last few years that we've had, which have been more than challenging, uh, Susan, I wanted to ask you if, uh, given what an extraordinarily challenging few years that we've had, uh, could you offer a few thoughts on uh, or share a few things uh, of, of some of the challenges and, and the ways in which they've impacted our broader FTD community? Sure. I, I, I think those of us who've been working with this community wouldn't have dreamed that um, things could have gotten more challenging, right? <laughs> But we know that when um, COVID hit and everything shut down two years ago, the people who are living with this disease, who already felt so isolated and maybe felt out of control you know, with their environment or, or with what the, the things they wanted to accomplish, that got so much worse, right? We know one of the things that can help people diagnosed is, is the regular, um, the steady, predictable organization of their days. And certainly everything was turned on their heads for them. We know for families and caregivers, um, those of you who were caring for your loved one at home, whatever support network you had pulled together dissolved overnight. It just simply disappeared. Um, and we had no playbook for how to, how to help you. Those of us who had loved ones in a facility, it was even more painful because we couldn't get to them. We couldn't be part of their care um, and, and touch them and know, be reassuring and know how they were doing. Um, I would extend that to the researchers, no question as well. Um, the clinics sh had to shut down before we understood you know, what was safe to happen in terms of, of care that wasn't COVID related. The researchers had to shut down their labs. Um, so it was traumatic for, for every part of our, of our community. I will say that the, the one word that I've always attached to Helen Ann, um, she has taught me, I would say, I learned about the whole community, we're, we're resilient, right? Granted, we had absolutely no choice but you learn what you can live through. Um, and I would say one of the most amazing groups throughout all this have been our support group leaders. They knew that their groups needed that connection more than ever. And here they couldn't meet in person at all. So um, we, we pivoted to phones, right? Pivot, I hate that word now. Um, and then as soon as Bridget Maria McCabe, who you met earlier on this stage, could, could pull it together, um, we, we org she organized Zoom for, for every support group leader that could do it. There was a lot of technology people had to learn. Um, 
care partners found ways to give each other tips and support um, a lot. Social media, I think, became a lot more critical in that way. And I would add, um, it was wonderful, our, our clinicians on the MAC stepped up and with, with their help we wrote a series of expert letters to the community talking about specific challenges that you all were facing and, and enabling um, you to have some of that expert guidance. Um, so it's been wonderful to see how the community's pulled together in response. So Susan, um, in addition to sort of enduring and, and uh, be, remaining resilient, we've actually grown um, <laughs> in, this, in these past two incredibly challenging years. Could you share a, a few thoughts on that? Yeah, so just like everybody else, you know, we had to shut down the office and everybody home, make sure everybody had you know, technology we could connect. Um, and learn a new way of working. Um, it's been isolating for us. You know, we've had to learn new ways of interacting. Um, but as David alludes to, during these two years, we've expanded. We've hired 10 more people, most of them in brand new positions. Um, I would add this is, we're able to, because there are wonderful, wonderful resources that are, that are available to us. But um, you heard me say in my opening talk some of the new things we've been able to accomplish in this time, getting some of our, our resources translated in, into Spanish, having the helpline be available live to people no matter what language is their primary language. Um, we learned quickly that the Comstock grants that, that were designed to provide um, enhanced quality of life for people diagnosed and provide respite and travel to caregivers, well, kind of the, the way we designed them was a little irrelevant in the world of a pandemic. So the board met with staff and we redesigned those grants and expanded the uses um, that were available to them. Um, through it all, our wonderful helpline staff kept answering more than 2,400 calls a year. Um, our fundraising staff found this great platform that somebody alluded to before called Charity Miles. So during this time when we couldn't go to marathons, we couldn't go to 5Ks and be together as a community, there's this way that everybody could feel connected, even if you're taking that walk all by yourself, even if you're pacing <laughs> within your house, right? Um, there was a way to still, still feel part of the community. And I think the last thing I would say, David, we talked about last night at the volunteer dinner. Um, the most amazing thing to us was we finished that first year of the pandemic which had been so disorienting and we hadn't been able to be together, but people had found these special ways to hold virtual meet and greets and things like that. And when we tallied the, the statistics, we were astounded to learn that the number of volunteers actively engaged with AFTD had grown during the pandemic and we'd hit the highest number of active volunteers ever for AFTD. It was astounding. And um, I have to say, I've always believed that um, this, this community could accomplish anything, and I think that was one point where we really proved that it was true. Um, Susan, I know, just one more note. Uh, we've heard so much wonderful uh, information today about all, the, all of the various things going on uh, regarding research. And I know there are some specific things that you find particularly inspiring that you, you may want to share with, uh, with the audience today. Yeah, I, I, um, I, the environment and research feels uh, like we're really at an inflection point to me. There's much more going on. You've heard a lot about research this afternoon, so I won't repeat what you've heard. But um, the momentum is growing, and I think what excites me most is I see true opportunity for this community to gain some control over our own journey. Um, the, there are more biopharma companies interested in investing in the development of FTD treatments and testing those treatments than ever before. Um, the FDA wants to hear from us in terms of when those treatments get tested, how should they measure success? What are the symptoms and the challenges that you all f would most want changed by, by an effective treatment? And they're listening. So this is why we founded the registry, which you've heard a lot about all day. Um, this is why we held the patient-focused drug development meeting, and um, it is true that each of you should feel empowered to participate in the way that you want to participate. But um, I am just so jazzed because the opportunities available to the whole community and to each and every one of you are, are so many more than there ever were. And the final thing I'll say on this, David, is um, I'm really 
pleased to have clarity on the role that AFTD can play for this community in this regard. Um, we are in a, a, a neutral position at that table. We have the ability to bring, to convene these players and bring them to the table and tell them what needs to be done. Um, to collab, to build collaborative projects with other nonprofits, with government entities, with the industry, with the companies. Um, to, to force them to share their data, to request strongly. <laughs> if, they will, if they will share the data they are collecting on our community. Um, that's what's going to speed um, our path to getting these effective treatments, accurate diagnosis, and hopefully a cure one day. Thank you. Well, yeah, absolutely. Susan uh, and David, um, I, I am so excited about the research that's happening, and, and I feel we've had a lot to do with spurring it on. I want us to see the same kind of progress in um, support services for family members and for persons who are living with FTD and a way to finance it that is not going to put everyone into bankruptcy. So we have a lot of work to do. I couldn't agree more, Helen Ann. I wasn't declaring victory and going home, just to clarify <laughs> that. <everybody. laughs> Um, and, and I would say just like the, the way the volunteer activity has built, um, we've been so impressed and grateful for the response from donors as well. Um, we appreciate every single donation that comes in, whatever size. But David, I know during the pandemic we got a couple of very special <laughs> gifts, and I wonder if you want to share a little bit about those. We did, we did. Um, I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, our, our community is incredibly generous. Uh, AFTD. Uh, has over 10,000 donors uh, who, who contribute to our donor community. But within the past two years, we had two really extraordinary um, uh, acts of generosity that are, are really allowing us to increase that which we do. Uh, Kristen Holloway, in, in, uh, board member Kristen Holloway in 2020, uh, created the, the Holloway Family Fund uh, with a commitment of a million dollars over 10 years and is creating the Holloway Summit, which is going to convene the very best researchers uh, in, in FTD research, uh, an extraordinary uh, gift of generosity. Uh, and Donald Newhouse uh, committed, uh, donated $23 million to, AF, uh, to AFTD in 2021. And uh, just what this generosity means, of course, is it really gives us the resources that we that we need to really be able to uh, sort of expand that which we do and to affect the community in, uh, in a much broader way and to support all sorts of initiatives that are so incredibly important to everybody in this room. Yeah, it's been, it's been tremendous. And uh, one of the other big things we've done this past year is craft a new strategic plan for the coming three years. Yes. You wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I would love to say a few things about that. I, first of all, I have to say thank you to all of my fellow uh, board members and AFTD's, uh, our, our leadership team, and all of our staff. There's just been an enormous amount of work that's gone into planning over the last uh, year. We, uh, our organization has a strategic plan, which we uh, update every three years. And we, uh, last fall, we all convened in Philadelphia and had an extraordinary workshop where we uh, sort of talked through all of the various things that our organization would like to do. Uh, it's very uh, aspirational, and um, uh, I, I think it is a big and bold and ambitious plan. And uh, then our organization, our, our AFTD team, has spent uh, the last six months trying to figure out uh, how are we going to get all this bold and ambitious stuff done, and what does a, what does a, a real work plan look like that will allow us to accomplish all of the many things uh, that we want to do. But So the board is, we have now completed a, a, a year-long process. And, um, and again, I'd like to reiterate that that which we want to do is only possible because of the incredible generosity of our community of over 10,000 donors, uh, a really extraordinary number that I like to repeat. Um, and it's uh, the four primary goals of our strategic plan I thought I would share with the group. Um, the first is uh, advancing diagnosis, therapeutics, and a cure for all. We can, I think we can all uh, get excited about that. Uh, the second is, yes. And I'm, I'm giving you our, our sort of high level goals. There's an enormous amount of work and planning and detail that l lies within each of these. But uh, the second is making quality and responsive FTD care and support available to anyone in need 
at every stage of this journey. Uh, the third is advancing awareness of FTD and expanding AFTD's national and global reach. We're increasingly a, an international organization in terms of uh, the folks with whom we work and engage. And the fourth is strengthening and diversifying our organization to have meaningful and efficient impact for all that we serve. So um, this uh, document will soon be available uh, or a, a consolidated version will be available for all to see. I am incredibly excited about it. I think it's, it's bold and ambitious and um, inspiring and uh, motivating. Uh, and yet, again, it's only possible because of the generosity of our community. So I, I thank you all for allowing us to put forth this plan. And, and I would just add, in addition to helping to fund it, I know that many of you in this room and, and online um, helped to, to provide input in to, in, as we were setting our, our priorities in this plan. Um, certainly, the Persons Diagnosed Council played a key role. There were other focus groups and a big survey that so many people responded to. So we incorporated all that data into our planning. Um, David, maybe one last question. You are just finishing your second year as our chair. You've got one more to go. Um, and I was wondering if there's anything that you've learned in this time that you th you'd like to share with the community about the organization that, that maybe they don't realize or you didn't realize before. Absolutely. I think, um, yeah, so those two years have basically been during the pandemic, and um, so that's, that's been interesting. But um, the, I think the thing that I have really learned about AFTD is that we are, um, we are nimble, we are resilient. I've been surprised by just how much we've grown in, in a short period of time, that this community really comes together, and um, we seem to, we're able to... Um, to take on new things and to engage uh, in ways and, and leverage relationships and partnerships and opportunities uh, in a very nimble way. And I, I, um, I'm, I'm proud of that for our organization. I also think it's absolutely essential uh, for an organization like ours uh, to do the work that we do. I think that's, that's, that's probably the, the big thing. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me up here, Helen Ann, for your leadership and your vision and your resilience, as I said before. David, for your ongoing leadership. It's um, one of my true pleasures having um, led this organization for 14 years is, is the relationship with the committed members of the board and just these amazing people like all of you who live through this journey and find it within themselves to stick around and want to... Um, build something valuable and positive out of, of such a, a challenging experience. So thank you both. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of a very long day, but I hope it's one that you all have enjoyed as much as I have. Um, I'd like to thank, in addition to Helen, Ann, and David, all of our presenters, as well as everyone who attended here in Baltimore and you online. And for all who helped us to plan today's conference, including all the volunteers and staff, thank you so much. To the healthcare professionals who attended today's conference, we so appreciate your desire to learn more about FTD. If you're here in Baltimore and would like to pick up a certificate of attendance, please see Will Ryder at the registration desk. Virtual attendees can email Will at w-r-e-i-t-e-r -E -E at the AFTD.org. We want to hear from all of you. Ex expect an email shortly with a conference evaluation form. Your feedback will help us to plan future education conferences that better meet your needs, so these evaluations are crucial. And I want to pause just one moment, moment because in the beginning I gave you some registration statistics and there's one more that I've heard that is very exciting. Um, we had registrants from 28 different countries participate today. And the U.S. makes 29. Um, and that, those represent countries on every inhabited continent on the United, in, in the world. So that is another first for us. So that's tremendous. And speaking of conferences, next year's AFTD Education Conference will be a hybrid event again, taking place both online via live stream and in person in St. Louis, Missouri. 
more information about a specific location and date will be made available later this year. Please stay tuned to our website, read your emails, and pay attention to our social media feed for details as well. And finally, for those of you here in Baltimore with us, you're all attended to attend in I'm ready. <laughs> you're all invited to attend a special reception courtesy of AFTD's board of directors. That'll be right outside these doors and the reception begins now. And I wish you all a lovely evening and um, we look forward to welcoming you into our work. Thank you so much. Thank you.